Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. With the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be with you all. It is a delight to be back this week for the third session in this Cambridge Muslim College's Ramadan program entitled Arts, Culture, and History Lessons from Our Islamic Heritage. In this series, we reflect upon our present by looking at the varied and dynamic cultural, artistic, and intellectual spaces of Islamic history. Last week with Dr. Bilal Badat, we explored the rich spiritual dimensions of Islamic calligraphy and Muslim cultures of craft. Tonight, we dive deeper into this vibrant Islamic heritage of making and explore the vast world of poetry, song, and music in Islamic history. The writing of songs and poetry has been an integral part of the human experience across cultures. For centuries, people have relied upon their own communal songs to enliven the lived experience of belief in God and to minister truth to the soul. Tonight, we explore this soul singing with Canadian artist, writer, and musician, and my dear brother-in-law, Daoud Warnsby. Over the course of three decades, Daoud has produced 15 solo albums, five poetry anthologies, numerous soundtrack credits, performances in some of the world's most renowned theaters, and collaborations with several celebrated artists. Within sacred music circles, Daoud has been a pioneer in the composition of English Muslim devotional music. He also tours and records with the band Abraham Jam, using music to celebrate mutual support and respect between Abrahamic traditions. In time-honored community folk music custom, Dawood's songs have taken, taken their own lives over the years. His melodies can be heard ringing out throughout the world in primary schools, universities, places of worship, rallies, conventions, and sing-alongs. His lyrics have found their way into the hearts of listeners regardless of age. In addition to all of this, Daoud writes regularly on his website, where he offers thoughts on simple living, traditional trades, and numerous community and charitable projects. Daoud, we're so thankful and fortunate that you could talk to us tonight about cultures of writing and singing in our history. Well, thank you so much, Amina. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you here, although we're so far apart, but it is great to see you and to be with you, and uh, thanks for asking me to come. Well, it's a pleasure, Daoud. Um, we have about 30 years of your musical community work experience, three decades, over three decades, you've been a part of a culture of folk music and folk writing. Can you talk to us a little bit about what folk music is? What is music of the people? And how maybe folk music has manifested in Islamic history? Wow, that's a heavy question because that has been debated and discussed and dissected for centuries by musicologists and folklorists and people who've studied cultures and civilizations. Uh, and everyone's got, they blur, all the lines blur between what is community music and folk music. Of course, the word folk music, folk comes from German, means people. It's the, the music of people. And usually it boils down, a lot of musicologists have boiled down the understanding of folk music or community music to be songs uh, or, or melodies or refrains that are composed without an objective of trade or financial commerce. You know, you just, you, they're written for the people, by the people. Um, usually there's no concern about things like copyright or ownership. And, uh, and a big key factor in distinguishing folk music from let's say pop music or other types of music is that it, it, it's usually been transmitted orally. It's been passed along from generation to generation. So while you may have songs that are popular music, songs that have become popular to a certain group of people at a certain time uh, and a certain generation, those songs may die out eventually in time with new trends and with new commercially you know, marketed music. With folk music, you see it carries on sometimes for generations or multiple generations, or in the case of even our own Muslim tradition, for over a thousand years, there have been songs and poems that have been passed along orally from person to person that we don't know who wrote them, we don't know where they came from, but they've just been there you know, for so long. So that's kind of a little bit about how musicologists and folklorists will look at folk music and differentiate it from other types of, of music. And the lines do blur, the lines do blur. You can have a popular song that's popular for a generation and it can, it can become something that's put into 
kind of the lifestyle and the culture of, of people and carries on for hundreds of years or for multiple generations. Uh, so pop, pop, pop music can cross over to folk music and folk music can also cross over into pop music as we've seen. And in Islamic heritage, though, what have you, what can you sort of identify as the way that music, songs and poetry has filtered into the sort of different cultural manifestations of how music, song, and poetry have come up again and again throughout Islamic history. Hmm. And again, I'm I'm no scholar in this. I'm just a I'm just a songwriter. But um, but it's been a it's been a passion of mine for 35 years or more. This tradition of of passing song along. So naturally, when I when I came into connection and in contact with the Muslim community um, in my early 20s. Um, it was funny because what I had seen and heard visiting the mosque and, and, and seeing the examples of, of, uh, of certain uh, individuals and, and their approaches to music within the Muslim community was as if there was, they were two separate worlds, that you couldn't have music and song and Islam, that those were just two. That was, those were the late 80s, early 90s. But it didn't take long for me to read and, 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 and discover through very credible sources of, of hadith and even through Quran itself that there was a tradition of orally passing along um, poetry and song that enlivens the heart. And, and it, was, it, it existed at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, and peace be upon him, in the 7th century, and, and it's carried through to where we are now 1,400 years later. Um, things like um, the Prophet's companion, Hassan bin Thabit, who was a few years older than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, um, by about eight years or so, uh, was from Medina and uh, was a part of that community that embraced the Prophet's message in, in Medina. But his poetry um, was, was loved by, by the Prophet uh, to the extent that there was a special mimbar built in the Prophet's mosque in Medina for Hassan bin Thabit to recite his poetry. And that speaks to us. Um, an incredible, um, it, gives, it, it, it speaks to incredible volumes, that act of building a mimbar, because the Quraysh, uh, they accused the Prophet uh, of reciting poetry, that the Quran was just poetry. And of course, within the recitation of the Quran, it denounces that, that this is not poetry. And if you think you can write something better, by all means, go ahead. You won't be able to. But uh, it, it, the Prophet felt no competition. There was no competition between local poets and the Quran. And the Prophet was so comfortable with that, that he built that mimbar that Hassan bin Thabit, get up there, recite your satire, because it in no way will compete with this recitation that we base our theological and spiritual um, you know, criteria on, but it will enhance it. It will enhance it on a very human level. So, so this idea of reciting poetry and singing poetry goes back to that time of the Prophet uh, and, and through the centuries, has at different times been, been of greater uh, significance and at times of, of struggle or of warfare or of conflict has, has been minimized. But it's always been there, this use of poetry and, and lyrics and words to enliven the hearts and the spirits of the people um, toward how to live better and how to capture their story. Mm -hmm. Daud, you've touched on this idea that poetry is something so deeply connected to the spiritual. Can you talk a little bit about why that is and why you think that is? Well, why I think that is, um, because I'm sure that, I mean, it, it, that can become a very philosophical discussion. For me, um, it begins, I think, by looking to the Quranic understanding of, of human beings and, and the soul and, and who we are. This, this idea that even in the Quran, it talks about human beings, you know, that we are created of organic matter, that we are created of, of sounding clay. I, I have a, a drum here somewhere in this mess. Let me go get it for you. This drum here, this is called an, an, an udu, and this udu is made of clay. And as you can see, it has two holes. So when you cover up the one hole and you hit it, it creates an interesting sort of rhythm. And it only creates that sort of tabla sound because it's hollow. And as a human being, we, we're of sound and clay. We're hollow. We resonate. And we know what this idea of, of creation, that when... when when the creator says, kun fayakun, be, and, and it is, and life is formed, there is movement. 
and that movement and, and many, many scholars of, of Quran and, and of, of theology have discussed this idea that the creation of the universe and the creation of all of us instigates movement and life. And with movement, there is vibration. And with vibration, there is sound, either audibly or, or inaudibly, but there is sound and vibration. And that resonance within us, that's, that's, that, that hollow human organic matter that resonates with life. And it, it resonance, it, it's like ripples on the water. It, it, it spreads. Its natural inclination is to, to have it spread. And to me, that's where writing comes from and, and singing comes from. It's that need to allow the vibrations, the freedom. Uh, it connects us in some ways to God in, 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 you know, in, in what we speak and, and how we resonate, how we resonate internally, and how we resonate out into the world is part of our connection to God. So that would, in Islamic heritage and sort of even now in cultural manifestations of how music has, music, song and poetry have, have appeared in this tradition, would you say that there is, I suppose this question is coming from, last week we looked at cultures of craft that involved lots of formalized study and lots of formalized rituals of maintaining that craft as well. And it, I sort of get the sense that music and song and poetry and writing in Islamic cultures, it has that dimension as well. There's a very classical formalized version, but there's this concurrent, other part that's the totally informal, spontaneous, and of, of the moment, sort of no, no training required. Is, is that a right sense of, of how this works? Definitely. It, it's yin and yang. It's the, it, it is the yin and the yang. It's the balance that we try to maintain, and, and a little bit of the black and the white, and a little bit of the white and the black. Um, it's, it's definitely a part uh, it, it, it's, it is two tracks. I, I see it very much that way. I, I come from this tradition that isn't as refined. I, I call myself a kitchen table singer, you know, I, you know, where you sit around the kitchen table and you harmonize and you, you try to find where you're, you know, where you fit best fit with your own unique voice. And there's charm and there's beauty in that. Uh, and then there are others who take, who take it more formally. They, they want to get into the, to the nuts and bolts of it. And we see that in life, I think in, in, in all different matters. There are people whose minds work that way. They need to understand the nuts and the bolts and how they all fit together. And they create in that way. And that is therapeutic for them. That is spiritual for them. It definitely creates um, uh, a sense of, of, um, of, of order and predictability and discipline and tradition. And, and then there are others who, who, who go at it the way I go at it. And I think there's beauty and, and a need for that in our lives. It's, it's sort of looking back traditionally at, at, at the, the, the story of Moses, uh, peace be upon him, and, and, and how the first thing that was required for, for the children of Israel when they were freed from their bondage, you know, you're in bondage, but that also provides you with a certain degree of, of stability, right? Because you know that you're oppressed and you can only do what your oppressor allows you to do. When you're free, you have the potential to fall apart. And, and they, would, they said to him in the old biblical scriptures, you know, why have you brought us to the desert so that you can bury us in our graves? Like we're gonna, so what was needed was, was a fiqh, was a, was a, were rulings to help the people understand their parameters and how this game of life was gonna work. But over the centuries, there's a need then for the personality of Jesus, peace be upon him, to come and say, look, I'm not negating the laws, but there's something else here that we need to look at, which is, which is a little less, scripted and a little more from the heart so yes we need to be careful of people who who commit crimes in our community but let's be careful that those of us who haven't sinned are the ones who throw the first stones and 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 we need to go in another look at the other and then there's muhammad peace be upon him who finds that middle balance that there has to be the middle balance musically i believe that's very important to it it makes me very sad when i see young people who are passionate about writing and music and song and and they go to university for those degrees in music and they can sit and play the most intricate you know technical uh, pieces of classical music but if you ask them to just join in and play along with you on happy birthday they won't have a clue literally how to do that and they will feel anxiety and fear and also it frightens me when i meet young people who 
who are self-taught like me. And when you try to explain to them that, that something they're doing is a little dissonant, that they could, you know, they, they need to hone their, their chops a little bit to, to create more feeling. They become very arrogant and feel that, you know, they should be singing songs in their bedroom one day and on stage in front of 20,000 people the next day. That, that's problematic too. So there has to be a balance between those two. And um, uh, yeah, I definitely see that they work together. They work together. Mm -hmm. I'm rambling. <laughs> not in the slightest, not even in the slightest. What you've done is essentially give a very small window into the classical theological tradition of how actually what you've done is replicate the sort of Ghazalian moment of of not neither neither erring toward too much rigidity, neither erring toward too much flexibility, but allowing space space for this balanced harm, harmony, quite literally, to, to, to take form and to take place. And it sounds like in the Islamic tradition that that's been there from the beginning. There's been these more formalized crafts and there's been these more spontaneous crafts. But poetry is, as you've mentioned even here just now, poetry and, and singing and writing one's own songs and poems, it has a particular way of e sort of being egalitarian, it feels like, because anyone can do it. And, and maybe I'll get in trouble with the, you know, the Oxford Cambridge professors of poetry saying no one can do it. But, you know, we know this because so many people who have not come from those, as you said, formalized training uh, strictures, have written and produced such incredibly powerful and long lasting song traditions. So I, if you don't mind sharing with us what it is about you, like what, what calls you to, to write and sing poetry, you're laughing. Where I'm laughing you? because my mind is going to so many places, but I'm thinking about the number of prestigious universities that love to hand out honorary degrees to yeah. pop stars. You know, because if you make a certain amount of money and you have a certain degree of fame, suddenly you do fit in with that world. Yes, it yes. Is funny. It is funny and it makes me laugh. Um, yes. Because, uh, but yeah, what, what makes me tick in, in that regard is, 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 you know, I can't afford a therapist, so I, I write songs and poetry. Um, it, it comes from that need to, uh, it's a need inside to write. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Idris Phillips, used to say, you know, you don't choose to be a, a musician, it chooses you. It, it, is, it is a need that you feel like you, when you're hungry and you need to eat something, you find food, you will eat leaves if you need to. Um, that necessity pushes you to seek out your sustenance. And when you feel um, a wound within your soul uh, or joy within your soul that, that needs to be lanced or shared, music and song, or for me, lyrics and writing, helps to lance those wounds. And it also helps to... to um, gush forth uh, the joy that I feel, uh, you know, and, and I don't know why that is, but that's kind of why, uh, that's kind of what it feels like for me. Um, going back a little further as well, when, when we talked about the difference between the, the, the technical aspects of creating and, you know, you know, you obviously want to build a bookshelf that's going to stand up. So you want to follow the plans and you want to measure properly so that that bookshelf doesn't just tip over when you load it. Same with music. You want to create something which is going to transfer and communicate the richest message to those who listen to it so that they vibrate with you. And there are skills and, 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 and methods for doing that. It is a, it is a science. It is mathematical. It is, it is, it is a very rich process, but to make a comparison between the two of the, the technical and the heartfelt, in our prayers and in our, in our salah that we've made for 1400 years as Muslims, the technical discipline and the means of, of praying is to help strengthen our, our discipline. But there are times when during that technical construct of the salah, one begins to weep and cry. The crying and the tears is the music, is, is, the, is, the, is the soul of that prayer. And you sometimes can't achieve it unless you begin with the discipline of the prayer. And if you are constantly crying and weeping and you have no discipline to that intimate relationship with God, you will also be very dysfunctional to others. So the trick is to, to maintain the discipline so you can release the 
improvisational, heartfelt um, feelings of love that you have or, uh, you know, the need that you have. So I don't know if that's, if there's a little metaphor for you. So though you've said that you write because you can't afford a therapist and that it comes from this need. So can you tell us maybe why this need manifests as a need to write as opposed to something else and whether that's a really human need, this need to write? For me, it's, it's a human need to write. Um, but I know that for other people, it, it's different. People's brains work differently. And I shouldn't laugh. And I, I don't mean to joke when I say about not being able to afford a therapist. I, I mean it very sincerely and very literally that our minds are filled with every experience that we've ever had happen to us and or around us. We, we, we have two ears that, that take in around us. We have two eyes that take in, you know, we, we are constantly um, vessels, you know, that are taking in and there needs to be uh, a means of, of pouring out. If you have a glass and you keep pouring into it, it's going to overflow it. Whether you want to or not, it is going to run out. Your cup will runneth over as they say. And it's the same, I think with us, we need to find a, a means in our lives to be filtering and, and, and changing the, that which flows into us and must flow out. If you look even at the Quran and you think of the first recitation, the first words that were told were revealed, the word is Iqra, you know, which means to recite, recite out loud, sing if you will, but recite out loud, read something that is, that is prepared for you out loud to others. Um, and, and, that is a verse that we often use to kind of beat children over the head and say, well, read, read, read. You need to study and study and study. But if you look a few verses later, you know, the, the text and the recitation says you, we have created you and we have taught you what you didn't know. And we've taught you the use of the pen, the qalam. You know, when you read something, you need to digest it, understand it. And give it, give out them, give back with that. You need to do something. Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the cave in Ramadan, in seclusion, right? Socially distancing at that time, didn't receive the first word of Quran, which said to him, hide, or be silent, or run away. The word was recite out loud. Go back down the mountain, get back up there and say something, do something, share this with the world. Because that is the, what begins, that's what keeps the change going. That's what keeps the vibrations moving in the right direction. And so for me, it's been words. I don't know why um, other people feel the need to release their stresses and anxieties and tensions and joys through sports and athletics. Some people will bake, some people will build. Um, for me, it, it comes through manual labor and working. And when my mind has been freed through that, I often find that after I've finished mowing the lawn, I, I feel like I want to write. Now the words begin to come. When the energy is released physically from my body, then the words begin to come to me. Um, and, and they help me. They've been therapeutic for me over the years. Though you, in addition to your poetry and your many places where you've written, you also do a lot of writing on your blog about the connections between making one's own music, telling one's own stories, and making one's own stuff. Can you tell us about where these connections are and, importantly, why they matter? Sure. Well, I'm a little embarrassed because I haven't been updating my blog the last several years and it's, it's become a very sort of sparse little place these days. But, um, well, I, I believe that, that, as I've mentioned, whether it's baking or cooking or building or uh, athletics, that we need to be motion. It, you know, water is stagnant when it sits. And when we are only consumers, when we only sit and we consume what other people have made and we, we watch what other people have made, we read what other people have written, we listen to what other people have sung, it entertains us. And it, 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 but it also has the same um, effect on us as drugs. It, it, the dopamine that's released to the brain that sort of pacifies us and, and, and has us become very lethargic. And it also stunts our ability to, and our growth, it stunts our ability to learn other things. If you are out experimenting or trying to do something on your own and you fail, you will learn from that. If you're only sitting and reading what other people have told you, you're, you're limited to just that. And um, 
I believe that it's important for us in our own unique ways to use our hands and to use our, our voices, to use our minds to experiment and to, to create and, uh, and create beauty, bring beauty into the world. So uh, I'm not saying that everybody needs to go out and get their pen and start writing poetry and songs, but it is one means, uh, it's one way that we can sort out what's in our minds and give back to our communities, to other people and keep our minds fresh and alert. Um, yeah. And it does seem that throughout history, and not just Islamic history, and I work on the history of Islam in Spain, but you would see all the different cultures that lived in the medieval and early modern world of Europe and the Mediterranean, I mean, singing and especially the culture of troubadours and of people gathering around spaces to communally sing and being able to, as we read in the texts about this time, being able to instinctively pick up on and carry on songs. So there are these historical instances of a troubadour coming in and singing and other people joining in, joining in the songs without quote unquote, knowing the lyrics as it were, right? So that idea that it's instinctively a part of us or it has been a part of our cultures for a long time. And suddenly it does feel like we are not doing that. We are more consumers in, in the sense that you've described and less producers. I mean, do you think, first of all, that that's accurate? That are we more, more like not producing anymore? And if so, what do you think are the consequences of that, of stepping back and being a consumer instead of a part of the process itself? Well, I, I don't know if we're not consuming as much um, or not producing as much. The internet is sure full of a lot of people making a lot of stuff and, and um, you know, but there's including us. <laughs> but there's something different. I um I can't help but feel that, and I only feel it. I I don't know it through extensive research or study, but I feel that technology has changed the playing field considerably. Um, if you think about the fact that we've not been able to record the sound of the human voice you know, it's only been about 125 years. So prior to that, the only way that you could learn music or a song would be is if, if you had been, if you had acquired the skill of reading sheet notated music on sheet music, um, incidentally, Muslim history uh, and Muslims of the past have contributed incredibly to that. I think the first notated musical, musical notation, you know, uh, among the earliest stems from the Muslim world. Um, or you would be, hear a song passed on to you orally around the campfire or in the, in, you know, in, in the fields out working or in traveling with other people. So 125 years ago, when we began to record music, it became easier to record a song and have it be distributed and disseminated to, to the world where more people could listen in the privacy of their own homes. So we now, and, and the same thing has happened with imagery and with, with, with film and photography and, and those mediums. And now the internet, of course, expedites it even further. Um, so it, it has changed the playing field. People now often are creating music and song with the objective of marketing it and selling it and transmitting it in mind. People who will come to me and say, Brother Dawood, I want to be a singer. And I'll say, well, what have you written? I don't write anything. Well, where have you sung? I haven't sung anywhere. So what is it you're trying to achieve? You know, if you, if you, you, you have an image that you want to be, but your heart isn't, isn't really, you've not done it. If, if you come to me with 50 songs and say, here's some songs I've written, I want to get them to the world, that's a different discussion. But people are thinking often more about how they're going to dissem disseminate the information that they, they think they want to make, as opposed to just writing because, you know, it came out of them like a sneeze. It's, it's, it's a different playing field that we're on now, and it's created this commercial music that's made it easier for the masses then to just be consumers of it. Instead of, you know, a village society or, or a society where immigrants were traveling by boat from long journeys, and those songs were carried in the heart and carried on the mind, and if you forgot it, it was gone forever. So you needed to sing it to somebody to have it keep pass, you know, passing along. Um, we're looking more now for YouTube hits and likes, uh, I think, than we are for the longevity of how our songs could help and shape future generations. Mm -hmm. This commercialization that you've spoken of, uh, there, there's definitely been a visible merger of sort of Muslim singing. Of course, a lot of Muslim singing still takes place um, in this very lived 
poetic, you know, trans oral transmitted tradition. But a lot of it is now taking place, as you said, on on um, on YouTube or otherwise. Uh, but it's very much merged with a commercial enterprise. And how do you feel about that? And is there a way back? I've struggled from for a long time, and those who know me and my peers in the Muslim community who they know that about me. Uh, it, I think many of them thinks I'm, I'm just confused and, and maybe bitter or frustrated or weird or old. Um, some I think understand, uh, but it is hard for me. It's not my cup of tea. Um, there's always been for centuries, there have been artisans and specifically poets, writers, musicians, uh, painters who have had benefactors who've supported them financially and have helped um, foster their ability to create so that that music and those operas and that, you know, whether it's been the church at times or whether it has been, you know, the aristocrat aristocratic society who, who become patrons of the arts, but along with the money that's paid to those artists to create comes the laudanum and the drugs and because you want to keep that artisan speaking on your behalf so you can continue to make the money from it. The reason why some people sing in the pub and some people go to the opera is because they can afford the opera and that, that music that's been created. And those who can't sing around the, the beer stein and, and, and make it a jovial, jovial experience. That's always been more my cup of tea, singing with, with people. Uh, as opposed to the other commercial type of type of music, and one of the reasons is because, along with supporting those artists with with money, um, many of those artists, if you look at even like someone like Mozart, they burn out. They burn out, and they literally die because they are being used to fill the pockets of other people, and that is an issue for me. Um, and it's the reason why I've shot my own self in the foot so many times with regards to my own work in music is I've never been of that tradition. I've never felt comfortable in that world. And it's a great struggle for me spiritually to be in that world uh, and to have to, um, yeah, to be a part of that. So I could go on about that for a long time. It's a very, I'm very sensitive to it because a dear friend of mine, David Lamott, who I work with as part of the Abraham Jam troop, he has a wonderful thing that he often says to people who come up to us and, and they say, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a professional, I'm just an amateur, you know? And he, he often is very quick, not often, every time. He reminds people, the word amateur in French, amateur, means one who does something out of love. And a professional is one who professes something about themselves. He says, if you are not an amateur, you should not be a professional. And if you are a professional and you are not an amateur, you should stop professing what you are. Um, recently, I was doing some work for a children's program, Muslim children's program, and I was so shocked and saddened to hear by the producers of that, of that educational initiative that they approached other Muslim artists in our community, and I told them explicitly, don't tell me who those people were. And one of the artists said, I don't do children's music because I'm a professional. And that totally broke my heart. I thought, how sad that this individual has totally missed the point of what love and music is really all about. Professional in our world has to do with how much money you make. And it's not really what the word has anything to do with. It's about what you profess to be and what you profess to do. So I do get very frustrated when I see our, our society, secularly or religiously, intertwining commerce into music, um, making it seem like that is the only path that's the only way to be a musician is if you're getting paid for it. Um, and when I meet friends of mine, like Lisa Gespit there in England in Lancashire, she's getting ready to move to uh, Scotland soon. She is a gem in the Muslim community of England, um, writing so prolific in the songs that she writes. And no one, in, no one would know it you know, when they'd meet her. But the, the music and the songs that she creates are just so beautiful and there's an example of someone who just writes from the heart and uh and god willing her legacy and her music and songs will carry on for generations you just touched on something so fascinating about children versus adults and i think this is something that struck me for sure as 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 i became a parent and 
how the lack of singing in our own lives is suddenly changed as soon as you have a child and the whole world of children revolves around songs. And I was reading an, um, an article a few years ago in The Atlantic, there was a piece about why Americans have stopped communal singing. So why the only time you see Americans sing is at ball games, for example, or you know, at like a concert where everybody chants USA, USA. And they said, even that is like a kind of a way of like a primordial yalp, you know, this, this way of like getting people to communally do something. I guess what I wanted to ask you is in your experience, you've done so much work with children and, and through doing that, you've seen how many adults have found joy through your music too and through your writing and through your composition. And I guess what I would, would love to know from you and I think what a lot of people might need to hear too is, is how do we sort of, why do we hold ourselves back as, as adults from, from doing that? And how can we maybe let loose a little bit and, and start singing again, or just even writing a song and thinking about composing our own song with our own kids or with our own family. Mm. Oh, I'm sure there are so many reasons. Um, as I, I'm not a musicologist and I'm not a theologian and I'm not a professor, I'm, I'm also not a psychotherapist, but, but I think it may come back just to self-esteem. You know, we, we were created and we were separated from that source of love that that created us and and we're broken from from birth and the first thing that happens is we have our umbilical cord cut and we are severed physically from our mother and spiritually from our creator and and we cry and and the world is shocking and cold and 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 um and we need to be wrapped up and put in the arms of someone who loves us to to find the comfort that we need and we are always on guard you know and and so when we see others who are louder or bigger or stronger we we tend to want to step back and allow them um to, to carry on you know um we uh, we're afraid of facing often our own truths we we no one wants a scar but everybody wants tattoos you know we we will be scarred by some tragic accident and we will be embarrassed of our leg being burned or the gouge on our face and we will look into having surgical procedures to remove those scars but we will adorn our bodies with the most beautiful tattoos Uh, and henna you know we we have these paradoxes as people we 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 want our skin to be unblemished and 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 beautiful like a cover girl ad in a bikini but we we forget that the belly button that so many people love to flaunt is is a scar our belly button is a scar to remind us that we at one time could not breathe for ourselves and so it it's it's we live in these paradoxes as human beings and why we don't write, why we don't sing out, why we don't paint. Maybe we're afraid. We're afraid to look inside. We're afraid of what others will say. Um, I don't know what it is. Um, We're afraid our words will be misused or used against us. There are so many reasons why I think we, we maybe don't write as much as we should or express as much as we should. And, and I guess the only way that we can heal that is to look at those wounds and begin to love them. And, uh, tend to them first of all and remember that scars are a reminder of where we've been who we are they make us beautiful and and that everyone has them and if we can sing about them and 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 celebrate them um it really makes life a lot more bearable in my opinion though as a kind of way of concluding i mean you have um worked very hard i would say just from knowing you personally to create this hearth around which people can sing and how in the very unhearth like existences that we, that we all have, I mean, how do we just create a hearth around which, I mean, it happened to us, me and, and my husband here, that one day our internet uh, failed, right? It just stopped working. So instantly we were bored and didn't know what to do and sat down and said, let's write a song. So we just started writing and we had the, so, you know, we had this, wonderful, creative, lovely evening of songwriting. And we said, why don't we do this more often? And of course it's what you said, because we're so dopely entertained by our, by our endless stream of entertainment. So um, just wanted to ask you as, as a kind of just a personal reflection on how you've made this hearth around which people sing and your family sing them, and how can others maybe try and also just create a hearth without 
um, disconnecting all the telephone poles and internet connections. Oh, you know, I, I don't know. As I say, I, as I said earlier, it's it's a need for me. I I need to I, I, just by doing it. You just it's like food. You you need you need to prepare something for your dinner and you need to eat something and you gather up what you have and you put it together. And sometimes it's a salad. And sometimes if you have more ingredients, it can be a little more meaty and songs are the same. You, you just have to build it and, and eat it. And don't be afraid to invite your neighbors in because enough for one is enough for two. And it's, you know, whether it's a meal that you've prepared or a song, I have a theory that, you know, that when one mouse in the kitchen is 50 more in the walls. So if you've written something, don't be afraid to share it because there are going to be other people who maybe aren't, aren't able to express their feelings. And maybe when they hear what you've written, it will, it will ease their heart. It will bring them closer to an understanding of who they are and, and take them somewhere on that journey with you. And, and I have to state as well, too, um, in my critiques of commercial music and, 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 and that whole world, um, some people who write music or write songs or, or, or or artisans, their struggle is how do I make, how do I get this out to the world? And for me, it's, it's an opposite struggle. Uh, one of my great mentors, Pete Seeger, who was, who was a, an activist and a, and a musician here in America. Um, part of why I connect so dearly with, with him is because I think we shared a struggle with the fact that we did make our livelihoods being professional for the sake of money. We get paid to make music and I hate that. And I have tried to stop doing that for 30 years. I have tried to take courses in other things. I've tried to start other businesses. I've tried to work, you know, in other career paths. I've, and it never works. I'm always asked to come and sing. And, and it's hard for me to say no when I see how people are, are comforted and, and, and want to come on that journey and want me to take them on that journey, to give them that strength to carry on the journey on their own. So. Um, it's hard and and uh, I, I don't have all the answers i, I uh, as you can see I, I struggle with my words on it because i've been struggling with it in my life and i just feel that each of us has the potential to create that hearth um and we may need a bit of mentorship but if we if we go the whole other way and just hire people to do it for us we'll never understand the beauty of the struggle and the the beauty of the reward that comes with doing it on our own inshallah Thank you for sharing that, your very personal struggle. We really appreciate that. Um, that was on a, as kind of a closing parting uh, part of the program, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a poem, if you've got any that would, um, that maybe somebody has written that you really love, and we would love to hear one of your poems, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us also. Oh, thank you. I was hoping you'd ask me. I do have, I have one here that, um, uh, I don't know if we, do we have time for this? this yes, morning? definitely. I've, I've written lately in the past few years, I've become very, um, I've always loved uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's poetry, especially the poetry that he wrote for younger audiences and children, because he really sticks to a very defined rhythmic meter and, and rhyme, which to me is, is, a, is, a, is an art of, of its own in terms of how we arrange the puzzle pieces. It often sounds very contrived to others, but I find that uh, it makes it easier to sing. And if people haven't heard your recorded version of a song, they are able to, to find that melody easier if you really create a, a proper poetic um, couplet that, that, that so i've tried this this poem here uh, isn't sung it's just um written but uh it's called a piece of land and uh, it goes like this there's very little i request perhaps a garden patch at best just six feet long by four feet wide fertile furrows tilled side by side one for carrots one for greens one for beetroots and one for beans with tomato plants drooping red growing at each corner of the bed then placed at one end of the plot, adding majesty to the spot, providing me sweet company, a hive set for the honeybee. For all the rest of all my days, I would forsake my wayward ways, with nowhere else I'd need to go, sing while I weed, hum as I hoe. In summer months you'd find me there, sun in my beard, dust in my hair, whispering beanstalk, drones to drone, in solitude, never alone. I'd venture there in winters too, when days are short and crisp and blue. Stand risking frozen nose or toe, deeply in love, knee high in snow. As time turns each calendar page, my veggie plants and I would age. Our colors fade, our skins decrease. 
our rhythms slow, our songs would cease. Then when I'd fall and lay so still upon the earth I lived to till, unclench the shovel from my hand and dig my grave within that land. Lay me down low and plant me deep neath sheets of dirt, my last long sleep. Let mint and meadow flowers spread thick on the ground above my head. Bid fond farewell on my behalf to my dear queen, her brood and staff. Leave their apartment there to stand, marking my little spot of land. There is very little I request, a sliver of the earth at best, just six feet long and four in breadth, to sow in life and join in death. Thank you, Taud. Thank you for sharing this. Is th this is, where did this come from, this poem? When did you write this poem and where did it come from? Uh, I was living uh, in Pakistan at the time and I think I was working on my garden and, um, and thinking about how we often want to acquire so much in life and in land. And uh, a wonderful sister-of-law of mine by the name of Amina Nawaz looks a little bit like you actually, had sent me this wonderful grid to say that, you know, a family of four could grow enough food and, 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 uh, and have enough animals to survive if it was just a small acre of land. And I thought about how little we can live on and um, how really little we need and, uh, and how little I really want in life. And that's kind of where the poem came from. Now, what can I say except to prefer my utmost thanks for sharing your wisdom and insight about, first of all, for sharing your poem, and secondly, for sharing your insights about the incredible heritage and living power of poetry and song. Um, what strikes me as we conclude is that for centuries, we have made our own stuff, as it were, told our own stories and written and sung our own songs. And we're in the midst of a major cultural shift and should reflect seriously upon the consequences of abandoning such intrinsically human practices. You've shown us how poetry and song in particular have a way of affecting the soul, of relieving the soul, a kind of unique spiritual resonance. You reminded us that we were clay pots and how we all have this ability to echo the, the divine resonance. And that is how much that is a huge part of our heritage, um, one that can be explored for lessons and especially of our present circumstances where loneliness and isolation are not just the byproducts of social distancing measures by corona pandemic you know, measures, but actually and severely unfortunately hallmarks of our 21st century social structures. So I'm deeply grateful to you for reminding us about the communal aspects of song, poetry and folk singing and how it has been and continues to be a means to enliven and join hearts together. Dawood Pai, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Amina, thank you. Thank you. Next week, as we approach the final days of Ramadan, we will conclude our series with one final session exploring Muslim gardens with Emma Clark. So until next Saturday, I thank you all for tuning in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.